this is the first movement nerd hangout I've done probably in half a year or more. I kind of stopped and I don't really know why. I think I just got lazy. And then I was thinking the other day, we should bring it back. We should do this again. So our topic for today, I was inspired for the get your shoulders off your ears thing because I was literally biking down Young Street here in Toronto and I saw a gentleman and he was literally like this. And I'm not exaggerating, there was no space here. And me being somebody who is very observant of people's biomechanics, I was like, whoa, <laughs> I just did a double take, like it caught my eye. How does one get that way? Like that's not something that just happens in the course of one day. You accumulate this posture over the course of your life. And I'm not even sure if he was aware that he was standing that way, let alone walking around living his life that way. And why did he get there? How did he get there? I don't want any of you guys to get there. I don't want to get there. <laughs> I want to have nice awareness of where my body is in space, at the very least, regardless of what kind of biomechanical foibles I happen to have. I at least want to know about them and what I can do about them. So that's what we're here for today. We're going to be exploring the movement of not your shoulders or your ears, but two structures that those things attach to. So your shoulder attaches into your rib cage and your ears are a part of your skull. So what we're really going to be looking at today is specifically how our skull and rib cage need to be able to coordinate with each other for optimal flowing efficient gait. The lens through which we'll be looking at our bodies in motion and moving our bodies in our movement session today is through the the framework of anatomy and motion, which looks at how every single joint in the body needs to be able to organize in upright movement across the ground that we call walking. So if there is a coordination you find today between your head and your rib cage, that is not the one we're looking for. It's, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a little bit of discomfort lack of ease, stiffness, soreness in the regions of your neck and shoulders and upper back. It's going to be a very simple session and we're going to try to keep it nice and short and sweet and not overload you too much so you can go home while you are home. Um, so you can take away <laughs> a few strategies, tools, assessments, exercises that you can use to make sure that you don't end up here like the guy I saw on the street the other day especially since winter is coming here in Canada and it means that we bundle up the neck and go like this because it for some reason makes us feel like we're preserving heat maybe it does I don't know something to look into so anyway what we are really going to do today like I said is look at the movement of the skull and the rib cage, and we're also going to look at a very common restriction which is the base of the skull where it meets your neck. This is a place where I, I just almost 99% of people as a body worker end up doing a lot of work at the base of the neck where the first cervical vertebrae meets your skull bone, your occiput. There's a joint there that's really easily smushed and compressed. And when that happens, not only does it just squash that area and feel uncomfortable, but it can restrict motion in all other dimensions in the neck. So if your neck sits a bit here and the back of your neck is a bit compressed, you'll also struggle to move your head side to side and rotate it. So just freeing that space up and having a more lengthening at the back of the neck there and decompressing it, it can help with a ton of things beyond just your neck being squashed. So, I think that is enough that I have to say before we start. We're going to start with a quick assessment and then I have three exercises to show you. We'll do a quick reassessment and then if there's any questions or observations at the end, we can address them then. Throughout the session, I'm probably not going to be stopping to look at you guys too much. So if you have questions about stuff that you're not sure about, if you're doing it right, if you're not feeling the right thing, feel free to hold that for the end and we can address it then. We should be done before six o'clock, I'm hoping. All right, uh, before I hit record, I mentioned to the folks that got in a little bit earlier that you're going to need a chair. 
just something that you can sit on for like five minutes. One of the exercises will be sitting down. So are you ready? Let's stand up and we'll do our quick assessment. If we need to know where you are to begin. Let me know if what you did was actually useful and to know where we want to go. It's like opening Google Maps and putting in your start destination. It's kind of important for the map thing to work. If you're familiar with the work that I do and that I have been studying with anatomy and motion, we often start sensing where the pressure is under the feet on the floor. So let's do that now to begin to get a sense of how your body might be organizing itself. Let yourself go. Stand in whatever crappy posture. I mean, beautiful posture your body wants to go into without holding yourself in a particular way. This is a space of no expectations on how a body should stand, just be you. And when you feel like you're there, which sometimes takes a while, get a sense of where you are noticing the most pressure underneath your feet on the floor. For me, it seems like most is in my right foot. And my left foot's quite a bit lighter, mostly on the outside edge of it. When you have that info for yourself, you can either draw it out if you want to, or just hold that mental image see it in your mind's eye so that you can come back to it at the end and see if anything is different. Because believe it or not, where your head sits in space can throw around where you're standing on your feet. Do you know how much your head weighs? It's roughly eight to 10 pounds. So that's kind of a lot. Imagine if that thing was sitting far forward. That's like 10 pounds dragging you forward through space. It's kind of important. And you'll feel that weight shift in your feet. That's a thing for you. I've seen people with their head tipped to the side and standing all their weight on one leg. All right. Now, I mentioned that our main interest is the movement of your skull and your rib cage. And are they doing the right things based on how they should move while we're walking naturally, unconsciously, without forcing them to do that? So let's see what your body can do. We'll start with the first dimension of movement. If you're a movement or therapy person, then you know the word sagittal plane, which is the forwards and back plane of motion. To reference your rib cage, I want you to find your xiphoid process, which is at the bottom of your sternum. There's a squishy bit down there where the bone ends. Take your xiphoid process. And I want you to lift it up to the ceiling. So you're extending your spine and tipping back your rib cage. And then go down the other direction. So you're tipping down your rib cage and flexing your spine. And the first thing you're getting a feeling for is how easy or challenging is this movement to do with your rib cage. We need to do both as we walk. Neither of these should be missing from your vocabulary. Next, what I want you to do is keep your eyes straight forward on the horizon and lift your rib cage up. And I want you to notice which way does your skull move? Do you feel your chin lifting up? Or do you feel your head staying still? Or do you feel your chin dropping down? Do the same experiment, taking your xiphoid process to the floor. Which way do you feel your head go? Is it coming down with you in the same way as your rib cage is going? Or do you feel your chin is staying up in the opposite direction that your rib cage is going? So there's a very specific thing we want to see your skull and your rib cage doing. When you have a sense of what your body is doing, what do you think it should be doing? What we actually want is oppositional movement between the rib cage and your skull. So as you take your rib cage 
up. We don't want your head to get thrown back. And the reason why is because when you're walking, we need your eyes to stay level so you know where the horizon is. Which actually means if your rib cage is going up and back, to keep your head level on the horizon, you need your chin to go down. So the rib cage tips up and the skull tips down. So we have what we call an off position. And this is a rule of movement that we're really gonna be playing with today, oppositional movement. Likewise, when your rib cage goes down, we wanna see not your head coming with you in one chunk, but your ability to keep your chin moving upwards to keep your eyes on the horizon. So that's our first dimension of movement. So make a little note for yourself about was that happening easily for you or did that feel a little awkward? A lot of people, when I'm assessing them and I ask them, lift up your rib cage, what ends up happening is this. There's a big shoulder shrug to pull up their rib cage and there's a big head tilt back. This is not what we're after. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next plane of motion. Our second assessment is side to side motion. This is the frontal plane. We're gonna do the same thing with your rib cage. Take your bottom of your rib cage on the right and bring it down to the floor. And then do the same to the other side. This is a side bend of the spine and rib cage. Left side of the bottom rib down to the floor. First, pay attention to if you notice a range of motion difference or if it's super, super stretchy on one side and not on the other. These are good things to know about yourself. And now I've already alluded to this eyes on the horizon thing. So as you walk this side to side motion through your spine happens with every footstep, which means if your head went with you in one piece, you'd get pretty queasy probably with all that jostling of your head back and forth. So we want to make sure that when you're side bending, does your head have the ability to stay level? So give that a try now. Side bend, keeping your ears on the same level. Can you accomplish this with ease? and without having to think about it too much. And when you do this, maybe you can get the sense of the head staying level opens up this one side of your neck, giving it a bit of a stretch, which makes this motion a very natural way that our bodies experience lengthening on one side of the neck, alternating back and forth with every step that we take. Which is pretty cool. That kind of blew my mind when I first learned that. I, I can actually walk well and then my neck will feel better. Wow, what a concept. All right, moving on to our third dimension is our rotational movements, our transverse plane movements. Now you probably have picked up on the theme here. We're first going to start just by rotating through your rib cage to the right without moving anything else, then rotate with your rib cage to the left. Get a sense of your range of motion. Is there one way that's easier, harder? Do both kind of suck? I'll never forget when I was working at a sports medicine clinic with a dancer and did our initial assessment and I asked her, can you rotate your rib cage without moving your hips or moving your head? And she stood there like this. She had no clue how to do it. And I was like, how are you dancing at such a high level? Anyway, <laughs> so we want to make sure your eyes now are able to stay straight forward at 12 o'clock. Can you do this? Is your rib cage able to rotate without your head coming with you? And this one's harder to feel because it's hard to see where your nose is actually pointing if it's really in front of you. How is this oppositional movement between your rib cage and your head? And because this one's a bit harder to feel, let's just do a neck range of motion on its own without anything else. So your rib cage stays front, just turn your head right, turn your head left and see if you notice any restrictions. 
Ooh, this really stands out to me. I can't turn my head to the left today. Don't force it. Turn only as far as it will go before you bump into your first sense of restriction. Don't force through a hard stop. So now you should have a bit of information about what your rib cage and your skull can do. You kind of know what you want them to do. And maybe you can see a bit of a discrepancy between where you are and where you want to be for the most efficiency through your upper body. Why don't we try a couple of exercises? See if we can give back some of what might be missing for you. And please know this is a very general session. It's not meant to fix your problems. It's not specific to you, but I hope that there's something in here that might be useful. The first thing we're going to do is on the floor. And our intention is to decompress the back of your neck. Now be mindful that there are some folks who are already decompressed. So if this feels bad to do because you're pulling apart two bones that are already pulled apart, don't force through it. But like I said, not an actual statistic, but like 99% of the people that I happen to work with tend to be here. So this exercise, I like to call the neck elongation stretch. We're gonna treat it as a whole body movement. You can do this standing. I'm gonna show you on the floor. You can maybe watch it first, then we'll do a couple of reps together. So the main movement we're going to do is with your skull nodding, which will bring the back of your base of your skull and neck down to the floor. And that movement of the nodding of your head and the sliding of your skull along the floor lowering the back of your neck to the floor is going to open all the joint space at the back of your neck and decompress the area. Now to help us along with this, you're going to take your hands and you're going to press down towards your feet. You're going to flex your toes up and you're going to press out through the Sorry, back. it's hard to hear you. It's hard to hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'll the sound changed a lot when you lay down. Oh, that's weird. Maybe I got bumped out of the place. Oh, no, it's better. Okay, just needed to fiddle with my headphones. Thank you for letting me know. All right. The beauty of live. All right, where was I? So, hands and feet are going to press towards your feet. And that pressing down is like an anchor so that you can then roll with your head a little bit. So just to repeat that in case it wasn't clear because apparently sound quality was bad. Sorry, it's still kind of hard to hear you. Perhaps you have to speak louder if possible. Yeah, I'll try my best. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay, thank you. So you're gonna do the rolling with your head, pressing through your hands and feet. And all you're going to do from here is hold and breathe. So it's on an in-breath, and then on an out-breath, you're going to press a little more with your hands and feet and roll a little farther with your head. And you should get the sense of the back of your neck going down to the floor. And then you're just going to let it go. So that is the movement we're going to do. We're going to do four rounds together. I'll point out a few things along the way. So if you're ready, take a breath in. As you exhale, press through your hands and feet and roll with your head. So you're nodding your head, feeling the back of your neck, top of the back of your neck sliding down to the floor. Take a breath in and out again here. Exhale completely. and then let it go. Now what you should notice is that when you're doing this, naturally your chest starts to rise up. So let's see if you can feel that on the next one. Breathe in, exhale, press through your hands and feet and nod your head. And you might feel the lifting of your chest up so your spine is arching off the floor a bit. Breathe in and out again, holding and deepen the position a bit. A 
and then let it go. What you should feel is a bounce back. So when you let go of the position, your head nods back up, which means you actually moved your neck. Let's do two more times. Breathe in, exhale, press through your hands and feet, nod your head, and feel the base of your skull and the top of your neck rolling down into the floor. Let it go. One more time. Breathe in. Exhale. Press through the hands and feet. Nod your skull. So you're feeling your head actually sliding up along the floor as you push your hands and feet away from your head as an anchor. Each time you do it, you should get a little bit more sense of that decompression at the back of your neck. And then let it go. And let's slowly turn to your side and come back up. I hope you guys were able to hear me for that. It's rather hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I we hope can, that we can see, so I think we <laughs> we still got the hang of most of it. Okay, okay. If anybody needs a clarification on any of that, maybe let me know now, since there was some problem. Hi. Is, Hi. Can you, can, um, so I noticed you had your wrists like sort of extended when you were doing that. So when you say you were pushing into your hands, where in your hands are you pushing? Like you're pulling your wrist back or? Mm, good question, yeah. So you're, you're extending back your wrist and then it's like there's a laser beam shooting out through the middle of the palm of your hand and like you're just pushing that direction. So it'd be pushing down towards your feet. Pushing you know what? Yeah, go ahead, sorry, Diana. Okay, so the hands are extended and pushing toward the feet. The feet are dorsiflexed and pushing into the floor? Pushing in the same direction as your hands. Okay. So pushing away from your head. Yeah, everything's okay. pushing away from your head. It's kind of like an anchor, so you can stay grounded through there and then roll with your head. Yeah, and then it's a uh, deep flexion. Right. That's right, yeah. And you know what, because that was such a fail with my headphones, uh, we can do the standing version and then you'll be able to hear me. And we'll just do two reps of the standing version because it's a nice option as well. So let's all come up to your feet and I'm gonna have to figure out now these headphone situation. So standing on your feet, it's the same exact idea. It's just maybe a little bit more challenging now we have to contend with gravity and the fact that our head might be a bit more forward. So I want you to have the sense of your head sitting right over top of your pelvis. Please tell me you can hear me now and I'm not fading out. I'll take silence. Hearing you as... perfectly. Sorry? I hear you perfectly now. Awesome. So it's just when I'm lying down, weird. Okay, so let's go through just two reps of this. So now your feet are on the floor. So you're just sending like some energy, whatever you want to think about down into the floor with the middle of your feet. So your hands, you're pressing the palms of your hands towards the floor as your anchor. And from here, you're doing that nod with your head. Like you're tilting your nose down and the back of your skull is rolling up like it was on the floor. You should have the sense of the lengthening at the top of the back of your neck, the juncture between the base of your skull and your neck. And as you do this, you might get the sense of your chest lifting up. So we have that oppositional movement again. And then let it go. We feel the bounce back into a slouch. Always do an exhalation as you're doing the movement. So breathe in. Push through the hands and feet towards the floor and use that as an anchor and roll your skull. If your head is sitting in front of you, it's gonna be really hard to do that. 
So some people need to take their head backwards through space a little bit. You should feel like the weight's even in your feet, not all in your toes. And then just let it go. So exactly the same as lying down, choose either. And interestingly, just after doing that, I have more weight in my left foot. So if you wanna take a moment to see if your feet pressure feel different, no expectation, but sometimes it's uh, interesting how just moving some stuff up top affects how you're standing on your feet below. All right. So we're gonna continue on, grab your chair and have a seat. We're doing this sitting down so that we don't need to think about your pelvis or your legs, just so we can focus on the movement of your rib cage and your skull. So in that elongation of the neck exercise, we were really just thinking about the neck movement and anchoring down. Now we're actually going to be moving the rib cage and trying to feel the skull moving in the correct direction. So you can have your hands wherever you want, by your sides, on your legs. And we're gonna lead the way with the rib cage motion that we did in the assessment. Sit on the edge of your chair so that you're not kind of rounding back. Or if you want, you can sit back in your chair if it's a straight chair so you can feel your back in contact with something. I'm gonna sit on the edge of my chair because my chair is a little bit too reclined. Xiphoid process, you're gonna start by lifting it up towards the ceiling. And I want you to get the sense now, after doing that neck elongation, decompression, is it a bit more natural now to keep your chin moving down as your chest rises up? For me, it feels much easier to do that. And now go the other way. Bring your rib cage down and feel the front of your neck starting to open as your chin is lifting away from your rib cage going down rounding your upper back. And we'll do this back and forth a few times and I'll coach you through some key points. Take your xiphoid process of your rib cage again up and your chin is going down. So what you should get the sense of here is the space between your chest and your chin getting smaller. So if you want to put your index finger on your chin, your thumb on the upper chest, as you lift your chest up, that space where your fingers are should get smaller, not bigger. Now, let's add in a pelvis movement. So I want you to roll with your pelvis so you're sitting more to the front of your chair, and the tailbone's rolling up. So now your whole spine is involved here. Now go the other way. You can keep your fingers where they are, index finger on the chin, thumb on your chest, and let your rib cage go down and feel how that space between your index finger and your thumb gets bigger. If it gets smaller, it's because your head's going forward with you. Keep your head where it is. And you can let your pelvis roll under so you're rolling more to the back of your chair, feeling your whole spine round. You might even get a stretch through your whole back here. Let's do one more round. Bring your xiphoid up. Feel the space between your chest and your chin get smaller and know that you're getting a lengthening and decompression in the back of your neck here. But what about those shoulders? Do you feel what your shoulders are doing? Are they lifting up with you or are they able to slide down? So I want you to get the sense of your rib cage lifting, but the shoulder blades on the back of your body are traveling down. And if that's not happening, a common culprit is a head that slid forward. So see what it feels like just to move the back of your neck slightly backwards through space. Does that make it easier for your shoulder blades to slide down your back here? And let's go the other way again, rib cage down. Allow the front of your neck to open up as the back of your neck starts to shorten and close. Roll under with your pelvis. 
rounding your whole back. You might get a stretch between your shoulder blades. Speaking of those guys, at this moment in time, what do you feel them doing? Are they kind of rolling up or are you trying to hold them down? I want you to let them go up and forwards and spread apart the back, giving them a stretch. One more for good luck at your own pace, rib cage up. Make sure your head didn't just slide forward. You wanna think about your skull sitting on top of your pelvis here. Chin is letting it go down. Shoulder blades sliding down and they might even be coming towards your spine a little closer. If you let your arms hang down, you might feel your shoulder blades want to come together, which would be great. And then the other way again, rounding, cycloid down, eyes on the horizon, roll under with your pelvis, a nice slouch. If you let your arms dangle, you'll feel your shoulders rounding forwards and slightly elevating to your ears, and your arms slightly rolling in. Both of these motions, have a break, are motions we need as we're walking. I think a big misconception about shoulder posture, neck tension and things is that people kind of think that rounding your back is the devil. And it definitely can be if that's all you can do. But when we're walking, with each step, we need to go through cycles of the back doing this part of the motion, the arching, chin down, and the other part where you're rounding. And if you can only do one, then you've got some problems. That might show up as discomfort, pain, stiffness. I'm just gonna turn someone, I'm hearing some sounds from the background. I'm just gonna check if anyone needs to be muted. All right. All right, we're gonna do one more movement exploration more for the side to side motion to see if you can get your sides of your neck to move and then we'll recheck how your bodies are feeling. So this one we'll do standing up. We're gonna start it off with a bit of a actual head tilt to find the neck stretch. To do the head tilt, don't just dump your head to the side. I want you to think about the top of your ear cartilage getting pulled up to the ceiling because we're looking for a sense of length through the side of the neck, not just a squishing down. So pull that ear up and keep think up until you have a bit of a sense of lengthening stretchiness on the side of your neck there. So this is great. If you have a neck stretch, awesome. But uh, since we're exploring gait mechanics, this isn't really something that we do when we walk. So to put your head level on the horizon, what you're gonna to have to do is that oppositional side bend. So do that now, let your rib cage tilt to the side. So if you lifted your right ear higher, you're gonna tilt your rib cage down to the right and keep tilting down to the right, the side bend until it feels like the world is level again, but maintaining the stretch on that side of your neck. There it is. Let the arm dangle, shoulder blade, and your ear are getting farther apart from each other. And then come back to the middle. Oh, that felt necessary. I've been on my bike all day like this. Okay, other side. Take your top of your left ear cartilage and lift it higher to the ceiling. Don't just go down into a neck stretch. Do it a bit differently, think, get taller. Like this ear lift is growing you an inch or two until you find a stretch. Now, if it's the left side of your neck that's getting the stretch, you're gonna take the left side of your rib cage down to the floor for that oppositional side bending. So this rule of opposition, very important concept for mechanics of the upper body and neck while we're walking. So you might feel even a stretch on the side of your body 
and on the opposite side of your neck. Let's do one more time like that. Take the ear on the right, lift it up until you find the stretch. And then start to go down with the right side of your rib cage, maintaining that stretch. So don't go fast. Try to keep the stretch moment to moment. Check if you shifted your weight in your feet. I want you to try to stay pretty even to your feet. Now on the second round, we can add in another point of awareness, which is don't let your chin go forwards again. All that work we did on decompressing that back of your neck joint. So if you did notice your chin has gone up again, do that neck elongation sense of uh, that movement we did earlier. So you're thinking the top of your head going up and your side bending at the same time. And that will give you probably a little bit more of a side neck stretch just by not letting your chin go up. One more to the other side. So take your left ear up. Notice if it's your ear lifting or your chin lifting. It is actually quite challenging not to do that. Even if it's a small movement, it's okay. Now take the oppositional rib cage movement. If it's your left ear up, it's your right rib cage going down, taking your shoulder off your ear. It's so challenging for a lot of people not to have this whole thing stuck together as one unit. Try to differentiate your body parts. Check if there's one side that is easier than the other. It's always good to know. Okay. Now, as is the fashion in anatomy and motion style of work, go for a walk around your room. Even if we didn't really do anything with your lower body, just walk around. It helps to get stuff to integrate because all this work really should be what happens within the space of each foot step, which happens in less than a second. After doing some of this work, we wanna see if your body will receive the new movement information and integrate it. And the things might even feel like just a little bit different. When you've walked around a little bit, come back, put your feet next to each other again, and we'll just check in with your pressure in your feet like we did at the beginning. And I already kind of mentioned things are feeling different. And again, they are more different. Do you remember back to where you were in the beginning? Where I was in the beginning, the outside of my left foot was where a lot of the weight was in my left foot. Now it's traveled more to the inside. That's very curious. Definitely more foot on the floor. Now check your head rotations. Just turn your head right and left and see how things feel. And whoa, I got a whole lot more ease going to the left now than before. Even though we didn't really do any rotational stuff, you might notice a change. Remember I mentioned in the beginning that when this back of the neck joint where your top of your neck meets your skull, if it's a bit compressed, it can restrict every point of motion, side to side and rotational. So just doing that seems to have helped me a little bit. Anything else that stands out to you, just make a note of it. If it feels like your shoulders are sitting just a little happier and not so up, you just feel a bit more like heavy. I feel just a bit generally more heavy, which means I'm probably not holding myself up out of my feet. All right. So what I would love if anybody who's here live had any observations or questions, now's a good time. Opening the floor. If you have anything you want to say, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Or if you would prefer just to type something in, you can type into the chat box, whatever is your jam.
how was that for you guys? Um, so when we were doing the assessment in the side to side, I noticed when I was going to the right, I got a nice opening on the right side of my jaw that I didn't feel it at all on the left initially. It's still, it's still not even, but it's much better now. I'm like, oh, I feel a little bit of movement in here. So I was wondering that's part of the tightness I have in the left side is also a jaw thing and not just a rib cage or neck thing. Yeah, it could be. That's cool that you felt that. That's a whole other, I think I did a session on the jaw a little while ago for some of my workshop students, but mm -hmm. I definitely have left-sided jaw restrictions and it's a big part of why my left side of my neck is a problem. So that could be fun for you to explore more, Melinda. Thanks for sharing. I found uh, the head thing, the okay tilty here and then the ribs is very complicated but when i get it it's amazing and then i look at myself and i go i have no idea how i got here <laughs> but it, and the other part is your instruction to keep i i realized in and through other things that you've done that i have my default is to come forward and the exercise we have is put our head against the wall for the um cogs I think that really helps as as doing it against the wall and on the floor as well to realize that instead of doing what I'm supposed to be doing I'm doing this forward mm -hmm. so it's nice it's you know I just found myself actually I've got a bookcase beside me and I actually put my elbow on it and said okay like okay don't let that move <laughs> it didn't work very well because I locked my shoulder but I could see it anyway so it's good Cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That's very clever with the, the hand there. But yeah, you're right. Then that shoulder will kind of impact on how everything else is able to move. But I'm glad that you tried. Um, what was I going to say? Yes, yeah, so a lot of people find that when they, they try to do the chin down, they kind of go down like this, which is that's, that's fine. But um, it will kind of just pull your shoulders along with you and not really get into the upper part of your neck, which is the key part we were trying to access there. So very Good work on that, Bonnie. Thanks for sharing. It changed the, when you talk about foot pressure. I could feel when I got it right because then I was level on my feet. Mm -hmm. And when I wasn't, at one point you said you'll go forward on your toes. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm forward on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many little things to pay attention to that it's, it's tough to, like you said, tough to organize it. It's very discombobulating feeling sometimes. And then how did I even get here? So good luck. <laughs> good luck finding it again. You can do it. <laughs> All right. Anybody? I think Viv has a hand up. That's cool. Oh. Uh, Want to ask a question? I was going to ask a question and now I forgot. Okay. Um, ah. I did feel uh, that when my first check in, my I was really like not in my right heel at all. And I was like really on my inner arch and that all changed after oh here was my question when we were lying on the ground and doing that first exercise and we're like sort of allowing our chest to go into extension i guess my like my default is always you know from my years of other trainings to like not do that <laughs> you know to hold that back a little bit so I was a little paranoid about like letting that be free. And then I just like, just didn't overdo it. I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, or do you want to see a bigger movement in the, in the practice so that when you're just out in real world, you're kind of moderate. It is. I'm clear. You're talking about this part. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And you're feeling like you might've been doing too much. Uh, getting your head back. So, no, extension in the thoracic spine. So this part. Yeah. You felt like you were going too much with your head? Yeah, well, too much with my chest forward, like throwing my ribs up to the sky. Ah, uh, I see what you mean. So more of like a forward, like pushing like this? Yes, correct. Like forwards and back motion versus, yeah, that's definitely something you'll want to pay attention to. And it's hard to say without actually looking at you doing it. But if you have a feeling like you're just moving forwards and back with your rib cage, then you might be. What we're looking for really is an up and down 
with a little bit of forwards and back. Okay. But not only forwards and back. Okay. So the benefit of doing it uh, on the wall, like Bonnie mentioned in our classic wall cogs, is that you can feel if a lot of your rib cage is resting off the wall, or if you're just feeling the pressure change of where your back is on the wall. Yes. 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 Another okay. thing you can you can uh, sense is again, like Bonnie said, the weight in your feet. If you're moving your rib cage forwards, there's going to be a big weight translation forwards with where your body goes, the weight in your feet will go. If it's more of an up, which is kind of what we're more looking for, then it'll be a more subtle weight change in your feet. Oh, that's great. okay, that's great. That's cool. I, I was just going to say, with all of that, just even watching this, as I listen to what you're saying, I, I do this. And it's like in our world, in our, our way of being, we lead with our eyes. And I find even doing the exercises, I'm looking down. If I look at the mirror, I'm looking down at my legs. I'm looking down. I, even if I'm looking at my face, I'm still looking. My head is still going to do this. Like I find it's a really conscious effort. When you say eyes on the horizon, it's like, yeah and and stay up there and now i can't see anything unless i just kind of do this with my eyes so it's a it's 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 a really mental thing that that we lead with our eyes and it drags our head forward um mm -hmm. such a good point i remember i challenged myself this is when i was 24 maybe 23 and i was just starting to learn about all my weird intricacies intricacies whatever the word is all the weird things my body was doing, idiosyncrasies, yeah. And I challenged myself to see how long could I walk keeping my eyes on the horizon before I looked down. And this has a whole like emotional component to it as well about looking down and what that means. But just looking forwards, I found it challenging to look forwards for more than 10 seconds and I'd find my eyes down again and then I'd have to bring myself up. And when I had my eyes up, it was this whole different experience of being in my body that felt so much more expansive and big and something about that did not feel safe for me mm -hmm. it also gave me a lot more peripheral vision yeah that could with your head up there's there's more of the world uh, that you can perceive and it was almost like my whole biology had to shift to feel okay with that and it was less even about my biomechanics and well it was about my biomechanics because i was like this but there was this whole other how we perceive and interact with the environment around us when our biomechanics change. That had to change too. And that's a bit slower sometimes to happen. Um, I don't know why I started telling that story, but something about what you said, Bonnie, <laughs> made me remember that feeling. It's, it's about really, where our eyes go. It's a really good story because two things. I walk, I walk in the bush. So you sometimes want to watch the ground because you're going to step somewhere that you shouldn't, but I watch with my head on the ground too much. And um, the woman I was seeing to do Bowen work, I, I said to her, um, well, she, two things, but anyway, I said, I have dreams in my dreams, I fall. And she said, it's because you're afraid of falling down. Do you walk with your head looking at the ground? And I said, yes. Now the end of the story is after a year of doing this stuff and, and doing more, I don't have dreams anymore of falling. Um, so I have more confidence that when my feet hit the ground, they're not going to take me down, I guess, because I don't have dreams about falling anymore. Not like I used to. So I, I just, I think well, everything you're describing adds up in that way, but it is a conscious effort to look, to look at the world rather than to zone in on the one thing. And I think, I think our, our, our culture asks us to zone in on detail, which is this and not have wide vision. Yeah, and that's like the left brain, right brain thing as well. Very cool. Hi. Oh, sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. Sorry, I'm mute. <laughs> okay, uh, Susie and then Ulrika. Hi. Hi, I just want to uh, say hello from Australia and to thank you very much for your accommodation of our time zones. It just is <laughs> great to be up.
for me at um, eight o'clock in the morning, not in the evening. So thank you so much. I just really enjoyed that. I just wanted to make two quick comments. The first is I'm a Pilates mat teacher and I'm sort of working kind of backwards really to where we should have started because there's a lot of issues with our training, I feel. But it's just so wonderful to actually learn the sense, uh, the sense of the movements. I mean, Pilates embodies a lot of what you're doing but you know the understanding isn't there it's almost as though we just repeat these patterns and I guess it's better to repeat good patterns but it's also really fantastic to have them unpacked and have them make sense because um you know Pilates what's the point in doing Pilates mat if it's just about an hour in the mat on the mat you know it's not about that it's about movement the second thing is it's very interesting about the eyes I think in the west I've done quite a bit of Indian dance and of course in the west when we say move the eyes we don't mean that what we do is move the head whereas in Indian dance there's an enormous amount of movement of the eyes where the head doesn't move so or it might move from side to side but the eyes are always moving and so there's a different sense of when you're looking at at something that you move the eyes to look you may not necessarily always move the head and I um, uh, obviously wear glasses and my optician has me doing quite a bit of eye exercise where I don't look down by moving my head I look down by moving my eyes to try and dissociate my eyes from to get my eyes moving not you know as a, as a kind of as orbs in with muscles etc to kind of keep them nice and mobilized too so but thank you very much for this morning yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for sharing that. And actually, if you, you can take it a step deeper and think about how the eyes and the skull have an oppositional relationship as well. And they have their place in the gate cycle. Uh, everything has its home in the gate cycle. And yes, we don't often think about how there's actually muscles attaching our eyes to our skull and they need to be stretched and stimulated and contracted as well. That's very cool. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rika. By yeah. the way, I also want to say thank you. And in Sweden, it's midnight now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I have stayed up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I want to ask a question about sitting, especially in front of a computer, since you're supposed to be able to access both this. Uh, uh, when when in gate cycle, but when you sit, you tend to get stuck in one of them. You perhaps you start out with the, the rib cage up, and, and then you slouch and get more and more into the screen. Do you have any um, advice how to to think? Should I should I um, try to get into both ends? consciously or? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question that I think every human being can relate with. Yeah. And yes, what you're saying is a very good idea, I think. I like to think of it as like a dynamic sitting sort of plan. And that can include while you're in your chair, doing whatever you're doing, you can do micro that movement. Yeah. Like just very small, you can make it big or you can make it very small. I remember after I first started learning that, that motion and that relationship between the rib cage and the skull, and I'd be sitting in a coffee shop and starting to find after 15 minutes, I was like, ah, oh, this is uncomfortable. And then I just started to do like little wiggles in my chair while I was reading. Yeah. And my body was feeling totally fine if I just did that throughout the hour that I was sitting and reading. So yes, you can absolutely do that exercise while you're sitting and benefit from your sitting instead of your sitting destroying your body. Mm -hmm. uh, other things you can do is just get up, lie on the floor, and do some of those movements to restore yeah. more healthy patterns into the body for one minute and then just get back up and go to it. And it's not so much that it's bad to sit, it's just the duration at which, the duration with which we kind of stay like that. The longer you stay in a position, the more your body learns that this is a thing that I do and uh, there's this thing that happens where if we are stuck in one position for too long without motion, our body starts to perceive that it's all one unit. It's like when you've had a ring on, um, when you first put it on, if, it's, if you've never worn a ring before, you really notice the ring is there. But after about five minutes, 10 minutes, you don't even sense it anymore. It's become a part of you because it's nothing new anymore. 
And it's kind of the same thing with the posture of our bodies. You sit here long enough and your body stops really noticing that this is a thing that you need to worry about because it's not moving. So we do want to listen as well. The first sign that your body is saying, oh, sitting's not comfortable. That's the moment when you either start doing some dynamic sitting strategies or you stand up or you lie down on the floor. You just break the habit before your brain starts to perceive that this is how we are. And it's yeah, really not rocking. Yes, hands here, I, I compress back in the neck. And also I've noticed I tend to roll um, the hands back in the neck and when I start in the morning, I, I'm rather round in my back and uh, I have, um, I'm trying to not do like that in order to see it straight. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it takes, uh, I do some cog works in the morning to, mm -hmm. to get uh, this rib cage moving because, uh, yeah. but it's hard to, to, when you sleep, you don't know what you do, you know. I, and yeah. I have a hard time falling asleep in a, any other position. So. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're doing some good work in the right yeah. direction. So just stay I with found, it. I um, uh, Gary Ward's book and uh, uh, his lessons. And that's how I found you as well on Instagram. Oh, cool. The Amazing. <laughs> Go Instagram. It does yeah. something useful. <laughs> some of your films on uh, YouTube. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm so grateful that you found me. I'm so, I'm so happy that I have found this because I have had the troubles a long, long time. And finally, I think I've found something that works. Fabulous. All right. Uh, we're getting close to the hour. So we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, I just want to say that if you do enjoy this style of work and it feels good for your body and you want to learn more, my next full on liberated body workshop is coming up in a couple of weeks on November 17th. I haven't run it for like a year almost, but I decided it was time to bring it back. Uh, so any, anyone who came live today, I'm going to be sending out an email with that information and also a special promo code for 25% off registration. It's gonna be available for the next 48 hours or until the end of tomorrow to use the promo code. So it's good if you wanna sign up that you do it with the promo code uh, by the end of tomorrow. So I'll send that to you in an email. And uh, there's also a couple of giveaways I have for you. So I'm gonna be sending an email out as well. I'll be drawing names from a real life hat. And if you win, I'll send you the info on what you've won. I think one of the things I decided to give away was a free spot in the workshop. Um, and there's something else that I'm forgetting now. What do my notes say? My notes don't say anything useful. I can't read my own writing. So I will send an email out tomorrow. The recording of this will be available hopefully by tomorrow morning, my time as well, before I head off to work for the day. So with much gratitude. Uh, will be, uh, you. The recording, will it be on a link in a mail or? Yes, yeah. I will send that to you in your email and yeah. all the audio quality snafus and everything will be included because I am not going to edit it. <laughs> so. no, no problem. I have forgotten right. to turn on the audio in the, in the beginning, so I missed the first five minutes or so. I will appreciate that you send out. I can look at this again. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody, thank you for coming out. I appreciate you being here. I hope that you enjoyed the session and you can always send me an email as well later on or send me a message on whatever app we use to communicate on if you have any questions. Have a great evening wherever you are in the world. Or yeah, Ulrich is gonna thank get- you. Thank you now. very much. <laughs> Bye.